Let's get started here. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, the uh, water pollution credit training in just a moment, uh, but uh, then eventually what we're going to turn to is uh, preparing ourselves to uh, talk about solving problem number two. Um, and to that end, I thought now is the ideal time uh, to take a look at the grading rubric for the final take home paper that's in the syllabus. So this is in your syllabus um, and it uh, you know, will help you. We've, we've done the, um, the, the uh, exercise of doing the outlining of number of problem number one. And so now's a chance to take a look and sort of see how your, your uh, the paper that you ultimately write, which will be on one of the three problems, uh, will be graded. Okay, so there are several uh, performance criteria. First one is uh, applies the principles, rules, and procedures of federal, state, and local environmental statutes and regulations in an integrated and analytically rigorous manner to specific fact scenarios, evaluates constitutional issues when relevant. Okay, so this is legal analysis. This is you know basic you know kind of Iraq style, um, all the law that you work through, whether it's. Uh, you know, NEPA, ESA, Clean Water Act, etc. You know, APA, um, standing, ripeness, um, all that kind of stuff. So, and you can see that's worth uh, a total of 30 points, right? Um, second criterion is evaluates environmental problems and solutions in light of changing environmental laws and policies in the United States. So obviously one of the things that you need to address in solving environmental problems is how uh, the uh, environmental laws and policies are changing, which we've talked a fair amount about. That's uh, worth 10 points. Uh, third criterion is assesses specific environmental problems as part of larger systems, such as ecosystems, institutions, and socio-political systems. Okay, so we've been talking about all of our problems as you know, in the context of their, their larger systemic uh, features, uh, also worth 10 points. Um, next one identifies a diverse range of legal, policy, and social tools for addressing environmental problems, compares and contrasts these tools, evaluates each tool for its usefulness and effectiveness at solving the problems, and explores ways to integrate the use of multiple tools. Considers both regulatory and non-regulatory tools, tools at federal, state, and local levels, and emergent tools such as multi-stakeholder collaboration. Okay, so obviously, you know, each of these is sort of giving you some direction about what you should be considering uh, and including in your uh, solutions. Um, and so that is worth 20 points. Um, next is considers environmental problems from diverse perspectives, including the perspectives of regulators, the regulated parties, the general public, marginalized groups such as low-income people and people of color, non-human life and nature, evaluates diverse and potentially competing values in addressing environmental problems. Um, that's worth 20 points. This, of course, uh, as you know, this is a class that meets the perspectives requirement. Even if you don't need the perspectives requirement, that's still part of what the class is about, um, including cultural competence. And so that's one piece of it. Um, and then finally, explores and demonstrates understanding of environmental problems from other cultures, demonstrates awareness of one's own culture and biases, and develops equitable and inclusive solutions to environmental problems. Um, and that's worth 10 points. And again, that's cultural uh, competence um, component. Okay, so that's what, you know, that's what the assessment. Notice none of this says that you have to use a particular format, right? This is a, well, this is a class in um, complex problem solving, solving of complex environmental problems that have these multiple dimensions. Um, so think about this as if you are preparing something in the practice of law that you are going to use as a strategy, as a, as a set of, of strategies or uh, plans for helping your client uh, address those issues uh, over time. Um, and so, um, you know, um, in many ways, what you're coming up with is the file, 
right, or at least the, the main document in the file. And as we've already talked about, uh, that uh, these problems are complex, multifaceted, and so therefore the scope of what you write is uh, going to be on the lengthier side, as uh, by, you know, uh, it's, uh, say for example, in comparison to you know, what you might do on, a, on, a, on an in-class final exam or that sort of thing. <coughs> However, uh, and it's not going to be, you know, like your, your two-page uh, response to a motion to dismiss or something like that. It's going to be much longer than that. Um, however, remember, it's take home. You have a whole bunch of time to do it. So before the semester is over, we will talk about which problem uh, you're going to address. And then uh, we do not meet, this class does not meet the last week of classes. So you have all that time plus two weeks of finals. Okay, so it's due the last Friday of uh, uh, the final period. I think finals go to that following Monday because uh, I know property is that following Monday, but I, I put Friday as the day because I actually need to start grading them and stuff. But um, but you have plenty of time. I would manage your time well. Um, you know, sort of plan ahead for how you're gonna do this. Um, if you are uh, sitting down Friday morning, the day it's due, and starting it, okay, uh, that's, uh, you're gonna have a hard time uh, getting, you know, sort of the, the A plus performance. However, if that is all the time you have, it is better to sit down and do it uh, and start in on it Friday morning and just write as much as you can and submit it rather than um, uh, freak out uh, and hide somewhere. Uh, and then when your paper doesn't come in uh, and, the, and the administration tracks you down uh, and so forth, you know, that's, that's, that's not the approach. To, I mean, that's not the way to do it. So, you know, if you get, for some, whatever reason, uh, you get uh, sort of behind schedule, uh, you know, don't freak out. Just tackle it and do uh, the best you can with the time you have uh, and so forth. But I think the, the uh, better performances will be ones where people kind of plan. On the other hand, do not devote, you know, three entire weeks all day every day for three weeks writing this thing. Okay, this is one of your classes. This is only worth three credits, right? It's not, okay, you know, I mean, there's just not gonna be, I mean, you know, there, there's no sort of, um, um, you, know, uh, you know, there's no extra points for A plus plus plus, right? I mean, so, you know, I mean, think about this in the context of how you in practice would have multiple clients and multiple things that you're working on and so forth. Uh, so, you know, don't, don't get carried away just because you have all that time, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, again, sort of think about what uh, you need to do. I, I have found, uh, well, students report to me uh, that students who've got, uh, who've earned A's in, in the class, um, that they um, spend uh, about uh, a total of two and a half days total. Um, so sort of like two full days, pretty full days, and another half day, and usually they spend the half day earlier on, sort of, you know, maybe outlining some ideas, reading through this, and so forth. But remember, you have every bit of the material you need to answer the problem already in the class, right? I mean, the sign readings, right? And so, again, think about getting that together. You've got, you've got all the stuff either downloaded, from the links or on Blackboard, and there's some of both, right? Uh, you've got all the PowerPoints, you've got your class notes, right? And I, you do not need to prepare a course outline, right? I mean, that, like you would maybe for some other class, like you know, evidence or something, right? That's not this class, right? I mean, that's not a good use of time, right? Just sit down with the materials you have and use them, right? I mean, as opposed to you know, uh, treating this like you're you're going to go into a a uh, into something with with no notes and, and time limited and so forth. That's not the thing. All right. Um, uh, I'm going to point out a few more things down here about some point reduction. So uh, fails to put name on paper. Okay, this is a big problem. All right. So uh, I, you know, I, I you know, you're going to email it, but you know, I really I need to to 
know uh, who's each one is so I can actually do the grade as opposed to go back and look at all the emails and figure out which attachments came to which one. Uh, minor failures to cite sources or submits paper up to six hours late, uh, that's nine points off. Submits uh, paper up to 24 hours late or major failure to cite sources, that's 18 points for each, up to 36 points total. Um, and submits uh, paper up to 48 hours late, minus 27 points. And if you if you if you've submitted it more than 48 hours, uh, you know, you're not you're not passing the class. Also, if you uh, uh, engage in un unauthorized aid, giving or receiving unauthorized aid, you're not going to pass the class, and it will go to honor code. Okay, and there's but there's really no reason for for any of that, right? I mean, you should uh, be able to, to do it. Now, here's what I would suggest as a very practical tip, which is, and I say this every year, and every year I have somebody who doesn't do it, and then they're, they find themselves in a problem. Okay, lots and lots of backing up. Lots of backing up, okay? Whether it's a cloud, whether you email it to yourself, I would do a couple of them. I mean, I'd do a couple of different things. I'd, I'd save it to a cloud and I'd email it to myself too, both, periodically, right? I mean, you know, I wouldn't try to do that, you know, every five minutes. I mean, you gotta keep, keep writing. Uh, but, you know, as you work on it, you know, every two, three, four hours, I would make sure that I had a, you know, entirely new version safe somewhere. Uh, so that if for some reason your computer crashes as it's just as it's about to, to, to be due, that you know you don't have, I mean you don't, that's the, your computer's not the only place where it is, right? It can be recovered from somewhere else. Um, thumb drive is another thing, right? But I, I would just, I would do, I would back it up two different ways just so that you don't uh, put enormous amounts of work in and lose it all, okay? Um, Let's see, what else was I going to mention? Um, citations. Okay, so I'm going to send I'm going to uh, send you Glade closer to the time uh, some basic guides. All I'm really looking for is you make some reference to the sources of law. So, using the words the Endangered Species Act or Section Nine of the Endangered Species Act is adequate. I do not need to know where in the U.S. Code it is. Okay, you do not need to put that in. Okay, um, um, I do not need for you to uh, put a footnote uh, for every sentence. For those of you who are on law review and are obsessive compulsive about this, you do not need to be a footnote for every sentence that you know, cites to uh, uh, Sol uh, Salzman and Thompson, right? Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. What I, but what I am saying is that if you just make some vague general statements about Say, for example, wetlands are protected. Okay, well, that's a little, I mean, that's awfully vague in general, right? Whereas, um, you know, that if you say, for example, under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act, one cannot fill or develop a wetland without a permit, right? Okay, do you see where, where I'm coming from on that? So, in other words, you need some indication of where in the law. Your, your statements of law are coming from. Um, but, um, but beyond that, I'm not, I'm not too uh, terribly uh, concerned. Uh, you see, there's, no, there's, no, um, there's no blue book style required, um, and you don't have to um, you know, worry about, um, you know, oh gosh, is it gonna be, um, you know, if I talk about you know, collaborative problem solving, no. Well, that's weird. Um, is there is there going to be some um, you know? I mean, do I have to find all the sources that I you know, you know, or can I kind of synthesize from the class? Yes, you can synthesize from the class. Okay, does that make sense? And so I'll, I'll um, um, you know again I'll send out some some more uh, precise guidelines. Uh, but, um, you know, it's mostly I want to know that you know where in the law to find the law, okay? So, yeah, to the extent that we study it, right? To the extent that we study it. Um, 
Oh, also notice, um, and I mentioned you know the length, but also notice um, that the you're you're earning the points for the sort of a paper in the very much column, right? Okay, so so um, you know that's uh, again you know, sort of being very um, thorough. Uh, very, uh, you know, I mean, again, you're solving a complex problem. So, so sort of uh, superficial, brief uh, uh, mentions of things are not as, uh, 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 you know, not as valued as sort of um, detailed analysis. Uh, but, uh, so anyway, so that's, that's the gist of that. Um, also, I will uh, be glad to talk with you as you're working on this. Um, there's going to be a uh, sort of two-week period um, in um, the la basically the last week of classes and the, the first week of finals, which is also Thanksgiving week, uh, when I'm going to be in Portugal and Belgium speaking on these sorts of things, resilience justice and adaptive law and environmental law and so forth. Um, at, uh, I actually give me several presentations at some universities and so forth. Um, but, um, you know, I will check my email as much as possible, but the entire um, first week of December, which is our second week of finals, like right after uh, Thanksgiving, uh, I am going to be uh, uh, having office hours three afternoons. I think it might be in the syllabus, but if not, I'll, again, I'll, I'll in email you, and I can make other arrangements to meet with you and talk with you at the other times. I mostly, actually, honestly, pick those days and times for the one Ls because they're more likely. I mean, they're they're first semester one Ls, and as property one, they're more likely to freak out and come to my office than uh, I think you guys will not freak out. But um, anyway, but I can make other arrangements to meet with you uh, if you want. But uh, you know, also to the extent that we can exchange emails uh, while I'm in Europe, uh, that's cool too. Um, I will. Yeah, I'll even, uh, I'll respond to your email and then reward myself with some Belgian chocolate. Uh, so it's, you know, that's a, that we have a mutual benefit then. So, uh, anyway, uh, questions? All right, oh, the other thing is on all three problems, even though we studied particular um, statutes and particular topics, all the topics and all the statutes are potentially applicable to all the problems. Okay, right? Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Uh, now, they're not all going to be equally applicable. Some of them just plain won't be. Uh, but for example, you know, what are the standards uh, by which a court will review an agency action? Well, we dealt with that in the first set of problems, but that's going to be applicable to any of these problems, right? Or uh, uh, and and so for um, um, you know for example um, on problem number two um, you might give some we certainly NEPA is relevant to problem number two right because there are going to be actions that get taken you're going to need to to um, understand the extent to which. Um, the uh, environmental impact uh, process, assessment process um, you know, might be something useful to your client or it might be used as a tool uh, by environmentalists uh, to uh, force um, you know, greater uh, action by the, the, agent, the federal agencies and so forth. So there's, you know, there are some, some of the statutes that we you know, might have studied in a different unit that would be relevant to any of the problems. Um, and we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about each, you know, because so we're going to go through um, class on Wednesday talking about problem number two and various potential solutions and so forth. Any other, anything else? Yes. Um, you mentioned, I don't think you said the date that we were going to be told this, uh, the problem that's going to be the final paper. Is that just going to be the final day of class after we discuss problem number three? Um, I 
I don't know. Uh, it's going to be before. It's going to be. It's going to be no later than the final day of class. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah. But I mean, if you if you happen to miss class, as always, get notes from your classmates. So you know, there's. I, I mean, my guess is that uh, as soon as it's mentioned in class, it will appear on. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, so you know, uh, but uh, I, I'm not, I'm not making a firm commitment at this point as to exactly which date I will tell you which problem it will be. No, that's all right. So, um, any other questions? job, especially in the context, uh, interestingly, of the Ohio River Basin, uh, of talking about uh, these issues. Um, and uh, so the starting point here is the, the basic structure of the Clean Water Act, where point sources of pollution are heavily regulated. Right? They're subject to uh, prohibitions on discharges of pollutants into waters of the United States without an NPDES permit. Right? This is a little bit just review now. And um, those uh, 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 permits are going to uh, consider and take into account the, um, uh, the various uh, pollution limits um, as well as whatever TMDLs there are for the, the waterway. TMDLs being more the ambient standards or the overall amount of pollution as opposed to the how much of different chemicals you know your permittee can can discharge. Um, and then of course those uh, permittees, uh, there's a, a basic built-in uh, accountability or enforcement mechanism because they have to report their discharges and you can compare the actual discharges they had to what their permit says. And uh, if a, an environmental group uh, wants to sue them, or the um, federal or state agency, the EPA, or the state um, environmental agency that has uh, delegated authority, then wants to bring an enforcement action against the, the polluter, the permittee that's exceed, exceeded his permit, they can do so. Okay, and so point source discharges uh, are uh, heavily regulated. Non-point source, uh, non-point sources of pollution, which are basically runoff, with some some limitations. Right, one of the things we know is point sources <coughs> include concentrated animal feeding operations, as defined by the statute (CAFOs). But for the most part, polluted uh, runoff is not subject to uh, direct regulation under the Clean Water Act. <coughs> However, there are a couple of three hooks that the Clean Water Act provides that do lead to some regulations or some efforts to at least control non-point source pollution. Uh, the first is that uh, all the um, Streams are supposed to have, and, and rivers, all the, uh, all the bodies of water that count as waters in the United States are supposed to have water quality standards, WQS, that are set by the state um, and that are determined on the basis of you know, what kind of purpose that waterway serves. Um, and so th those water quality standards are primarily the standards for different kinds of pollutants. So you have different, I mean, so water quality standards isn't just one thing. It's, it's a whole list of pollutants, and then the amount uh, the, of pollutants um, that um, um, should be the maximum allowed in that waterway to, say, for example, support aquatic 
wildlife to support aquatic species, uh, fish and mussels and other kinds of things, or to be safe for human contact, or to, to support recreational use, or to support navigation um, in uh, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, boating and, and uh, navigation and commerce and that kind of thing. Okay? So that's the idea. From the water quality standards, then the state is required to assess the actual uh, water quality uh, according to these various pollutants in that body of water. And if there is, is enough um, uh, violation of those water quality standards over enough days per year, and it's not very many, then that uh, body of water has to be put on a list of impaired waters, of impaired waters. Um, and uh, that includes <coughs> subunits of that waterway. So it might be that you have some upstream uh, stretch of a stream that is not impaired because there's hardly anything around it and it's upstream, it's near the mountains maybe, so if, uh, and it's, the water quality is pretty decent, but then you might have stretches of that stream that are listed as impaired. Okay? And as I mentioned before, the um, lots and lots of, of waterways in the United States are listed as impaired, and those that are not listed as impaired um, it is more often due to state inaction or lack of, of data than it is from just the idea that they're actually clean. Okay? So, so in other words, we, we have uh, many waterways that do not meet water quality standards, whether they're, we, we have the data on that and the state's listed it or not, that's part of the problem. So once a state, uh, once a waterway is listed as impaired, the state is required to set TMDLs, total maximum daily loads, and if they do not, the EPA is required to set TMDLs for the state. Okay, so basically if the state doesn't do its job, the EPA steps in and says, okay, well, we'll set it for you. Um, and TMDLs are the total maximum amount of these pollutants that um, a waterway can absorb or, or handle in, on a, you know, in, in any given day and still meet water quality standards. Okay? Then the state is required to regulate all sources of pollutants, both point and non-point, in order to, um, to meet the TMDLs, okay? So the TMDL is a standard for that body of water, and there's lots of different sources of pollutants, and so the state has to take action. And again, if they don't, the EPA can take action against the state. Well, as we pointed out, uh, one of the problems is that uh, states don't set TMDLs, they, it's time consuming, it's costly, they don't want to do it, they don't want to have to, to regulate all of these various <coughs> sources of, of pollutants and so on and so forth, so it doesn't happen. Then the EPA doesn't bother to take the time and effort or they think they can keep coaxing the state into doing it and so on and so forth. So, both the EPA and the state get sued by environmental groups. There is a citizen suit provision in the Clean Water Act, and it actually provides for attorney's fees for successful litigants, which creates an incentive system for environmental groups to sue under the Clean Water Act. Okay? And because uh, one of the things that can happen is that then they can get the, the cost of litigating this covered, which of course covers some of their, their budget, um, and so forth. Um, in addition, um, they want, often the environmental groups want these TMDLs to be set so that then, you know, efforts can at least begin to try to force all of the sources of pollutants to try to get a handle on what they're on the pollution level and improve the stream quality. So, so that is one mechanism, but you see how very indirect it is. And as you might imagine, states are more likely to go after point sources 
because they're easier to identify, right? So it's easier to go after the industry and the, um, the sewer treatment plants and say, hey, you've got to, to, to uh, reduce even further your discharges of all of these pollutants. And, and of course, what we care about for our problem are the nutrients, right? So they, they can get, uh, they can go uh, to MSD and say, hey, you need to really ratchet down your discharges of nutrients into uh, the, the, you know, the streams around here. Um, much, you know, so then the question is, what do they do for non-point sources? Well, think about this for a moment. Um, farmers, so we're representing the Kentucky Farm Bureau, right? And so um, uh, agricultural producers, um, there are, they have, were ex you know, explicitly exempted from direct regulation under the, e under the Clean Water Act. And so they have a certain, and they have a certain amount of political power to kind of push back and say, hey, you know, don't, don't squelch farming, don't kill off farming, which is pretty economically marginal activity for most of us um, anyway, um, uh, by coming in with these sort of heavy top-down federal regulations. So, so you get a certain amount of sort of pushback. Um, and then uh, the other thing is, of course, the farmers say, you know, we're being targeted when really there's a whole lot of pollution coming from urban and suburban runoff. Okay, so not necessarily the sewer treatment plants. I mean, it is coming from that, and of course they want lots of regulation of the sewer treatment plants rather than the farmers, right? Uh, right everybody follow that? Farmers would rather the sewer treatment plants be regulated than them, but they're saying, you know, all these, all these lawns and landscaping and so forth have pollution running off, and you're not regulating them. So think about this for a moment. Think about how likely is it that the state of Kentucky is going to issue a regulation that says you cannot fertilize your lawn. Okay? That nobody can fertilize their lawn. Okay, what's, what's the politically, what's the likelihood of that happening? Right? Zero, right? Less than zero. Right? It's not going to happen. Right? It's not going to happen. I mean, it's hard enough in the western part of the United States where water is scarce to get enough political will to get people to quit watering their lawns when there's not enough water, right? And it happens, sometimes it happens out of necessity, but it takes an enormous amount of what we call expenditure of political capital to, to, to do that because people don't like it. Everybody feels like they should be able to do what they want with their house and their lawn and so forth, right? Okay, so you see one of the, the issues going on there. Um, and the other thing is, of course, that when you have lots and lots of different sources, the state might come up with a plan that says, hey, this is how we're going to try to achieve our TMDLs. It's going to be totally ineffective. They're not going to achieve their TMDLs. And so what's the consequence? What's the consequence, right? All they have to do is have some plan. It does not... The, the, the Clean Water Act does not require that it be effective, or it does not require them to do certain things. And so, um, you know, now again, they might be sued for not doing enough, but at some point, there is no requirement that says you must, um, you, you must make farmers uh, uh, reduce their runoff pollution to X level. Okay, that's, that, that is not a part of uh, the Clean Water Act. Um, if they did nothing whatsoever, that might be problematic, but it, it's not a precise regulatory uh, standard. Nonetheless, well, the other thing, the other side of this, though, is the watershed planning process, right? So I mentioned before there are um, incentives in place to um, have uh, states and other stakeholders engage in watershed planning in order to try to improve water quality and improve the functions of those watersheds. And so that also can be a mechanism by which in the plans, certain sources of pollution, in this case nutrient runoff, 
or nutrient pollution are identified in targets identified in the plan for how they might be reduced. And so, you know, 12% less from agriculture, uh, you know, 6% less from uh, urban and suburban lawns, 23% uh, less from uh, sewer systems, et cetera, right? I mean, so you see kind of how that, you know, they could get incorporated in the planning process. And especially if these planning processes are multi-stakeholder, right? So it's just a set of plans, it's not a set of regulations, but sometimes then the plans lead to the government enacting regulations, okay? And sometimes it can be even surprising how this works. Sometimes these watershed plans lead local governments to impose certain requirements through their zoning codes and other sorts of things. So like new development has to, in some jurisdictions, have zero net runoff which means all the water, all the runoff, all the runoff from the development site has to be maintained um, and, uh, and dealt with, managed on site, which means things like um, various uh, sort of, uh, 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 well, it's what called, what are called uh, best management practices, BMPs, and you see some reference to that, but in the land development context, those are things like bioswells and rain gardens and uh, dry wells and uh, you know reservoirs and holding de uh, ponds, detention basins, retention basins, and so forth. So, like for example, the oval out here, right? Everybody, right? You know what I'm talking about, right in front of the law school. Okay, that is a big detention basin for water. So all the stormwater runoff. So back in 2009, okay, we had a storm event. It rained, I forget how many inches, eight inches an hour or something like that. It was, I mean, it was a huge rainfall event, okay, and things were so flooded that people at UofL lost their cars, okay, they, I mean, like, literally their, their cars had to be towed away and were totaled because they were uh, uh, under so much water and, it, you know, got the engine wet and so forth. Okay, and the, down here, at the third street, okay, right? You know where, where, okay, where the trucks get stuck under the underpass all the time, right? Okay, so it was closed off all the way back up past the, the circle here, okay? All the way on Eastern Parkway to that, to that um, crosswalk. And not the one at Eastern Parkway, I mean, not the one at Third Street, but all the way back by the speed school, right? You know what I'm saying? Okay, it was that much water, why? Well, it's because it's running off of all the roofs, um, streets, sidewalks here at UofL, and it had nowhere to go. It, it was over, it was coming down so fast, it overwhelmed the storm system. So, well, what's happening with that? Well, all that is gonna be carrying pollutants into our waterways. So what do we do? We put it now into this, this big, basin underneath all that grass and so forth and it gets retained there and eventually filters either down into the groundwater or eventually filters out slowly uh, and so forth. Okay, so that's, that's an example of how you can do that kind of thing. And so now there are local governments that have adopted these standards, sometimes they're called low impact development standards or LID, um, sometimes they're called best management practices. BMPs, and sometimes they're called green and blue infrastructure, GBI. Okay, different terms that get thrown around. You can imagine different uh, professions like different terminology, but it's all the same thing. It is, it's using engineered and natural processes to try to hold the stormwater from running off, and so that's going to reduce the amount of non-point source pollutants that are ending up in waterways. Okay, so so it does those watershed plans can have effects. Now that's not everywhere, right? But they can have uh, effects. They can also lead to restoration projects. And so we've talked about that, restoration of wetlands, restoration of riparian zones, uh, planting of different kinds of, of uh, landscaping that will hold the water and filter out the pollutants and that kind of stuff. So that's another thing that happens. Um, Stuff. Okay, so all that um, is to say that there are these indirect ways of 
trying to reduce the amount of non-point source pollution, and um, they sometimes then lead to regulation, command and control regulation. Um, we are more likely to see command and control regulation over nutrients in the Mississippi River Basin if the EPA were to adopt numerical criteria for, for nutrients, numerical criteria for nitrogen and phosphorus in the Mississippi River Basin. Right now, their standards are only qualitative, just words, not numbers. But once they, if they ever adopt numbers, that obviously puts more pressure on states, on those TMDLs, on the water uh, shed plans, etc. Because now there are measurable targets. And so that's one of the reasons why the Kentucky Farm Bureau, your client, and other, others have pushed back and why um, e, uh, push back against quantum, uh, uh, numeric criteria. And even in the Obama administration, the EPA refused to adopt numeric criteria because it's very politically unpopular. And so you already read the Gulf Restoration Network case, right, where uh, a bunch of environmental groups sued and the court initially said, well, the agency hadn't uh, offered really an explanation as to why. They just said they weren't going to do it, and they hadn't offered an explanation. So once the EPA offered this explanation that it preferred to rely on voluntary programs, such as the Mississippi River Basin Initiative, for example, and other programs to reduce nutrients rather than the adoption of numeric criteria, what you get is the federal courts deferring, deferring to the agency because why? Because it considered all the relevant factors, it considered the evidence, and it came up with a reasoned, supported decision, right? Does that sound like you know, what we've been studying all semester long? Okay, so now that takes some pressure off, but the reality is that many states have TMDLs that are going to start forcing them to have to deal with um, the, um, the fact that they have too many nutrients, right? The hypoxic zone is a politically and socially uh, uh, problem, well, it's, it's a political social problem, right? I mean, right? I mean, so, you know, if, you, if, you're, if your state is producing lots of nutrients that are ending up in the waterways, it might become more local, like we've just seen in the Ohio River, where you have toxic algae blooms, right? And, and, and that tends to get people's attention. It's gotten people's attention in the Great Lakes Basin. It's gotten attention in Florida. So that's actually one of the things uh, that uh, the, the new governor, um, DeSantis, is that his name, uh, right, is, uh, has done, um, so actually surprised a lot of environmentalists, but he said, hey, this is a high priority. Basically what he did is he took the entire South Florida Water Management District Board, fired them all, and replaced them because he said they weren't doing enough to reduce nutrient runoff, okay? So that's, this is a conservative Republican governor. So what I'm saying is, don't get carried away with the politics here. If it's a problem, it's a problem for everybody, right? And so it's, uh, there, there becomes pressure. So the, the, the question is, how are you gonna deal with it? So one possibility is command and control regulation, right? And so that's one possibility. Um, another uh, possibility is voluntary action and incentive-based programs. So you see in the reading reference to some of the 
uh, programs we talked about earlier, which uh, like the uh, CRP's Conservation Reserve Program, and several others, Equip and others. And the point here is that these are situations where either uh, pol polluters or potential polluters are taking voluntary action. Um, and sometimes that's in response to incentives that are available, such as financial assistance or technical assistance. Say, for example, farmers adopting best management practices to reduce their, their pollution runoff from their, from their farms. Okay? So it might be, for example, creating a vegetated buffer alongside the streams or alongside the edge of the property where, is, where runoff's gonna occur because that will stop the water flow or at least slow it. And then some of those pollutants are gonna filter into the ground and be you know, managed, absorbed by the vegetation or at least held there or so forth. Um, and so that's, you know, that's an example, the best management practice. Um, Another has to do with land conservation and management. And that can be, uh, we've talked about management and conservation of the federal lands, right? Um, and then we've also talked about uh, things like conservation easements, land trust, those kinds of things like the Nature Conservancy uh, acquiring property along uh, the Ohio and Mississippi rivers uh, in order to try to, again, manage, to, to pr preserve wetlands and so forth, right? Um, so obviously, Section 404, protecting wetlands, is a command and control regulation, but the sort of voluntary, or these uh, land conservation management programs might involve, say, for example, how the National Park Service manages Mammoth Cave National Park, right, which includes not only the cave itself, but the land and so forth surrounding it. Um, and it might involve uh, things like land trust and farmers granting conservation easements and so forth. The, um, but yet, another sort of uh, tool that's out there are what are called market mechanisms, but I put that in quotes because they're not totally true market mechanisms. They are market mechanisms that exist in the shadow of one of these others, usually command and control regulation. Okay, so there's a set of regulations, but you can um, you can uh, avoid or reduce the amount that you have to comply with uh, the regulation by basically buying credits from somebody who has exceeded what is required by the regulation or, or reduced its pollution more. Okay, and so this is this is uh, pollution credit trading. And it could be any polluter that offers the credits, okay? And in order to get credits and offer them, the polluter has to reduce its generation of pollution, in this case, nutrient uh, pollution, below the regulatory target, okay? So, you know, let's say that the regulatory limit is 100. I'm just making, you know, this is totally fictional. I'm just making something up for ease. But if you, if, if you were, say, a farmer and you, you adopted a bunch of best management practices and reduced your nutrient runoff from 100 to 50, right? Now you have a credit of 50 to offer to, say, some old sewer treatment facility that is where it's just too costly to change the technology. It's where it's, too, it would be, it's just too expensive for them to change the technology, and they would rather pay the farmer for 50 credits 
than to invest in building an entirely new treatment plant, right? It's cheaper for the, for, for the treatment plant, and the farmer makes money off of it, right? Because everybody see the, 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 the farmer's going to sell the credits. Obviously, let me just finish, uh, uh, but obviously the credits have to be recognized by the regulatory entity, right? And so there has to be some system for evaluating what the credits are, how much they, how much, uh, how many of them are. Now, then supposedly the market will set the value, but that sort of idea, a recognizing, okay, farmer A transferred 50 credits to uh, uh, sewer plant B. Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering, since like a sewer treatment kind of produces different pollutants than mm. a farm. Yep. If you can trade it for whatever, I mean, it doesn't matter what. Well, it's, it depends on what the pollutant. I mean, so so these are credits for for specific, because the 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 regulatory requirement, right, is going to be for particular pollutants. So we're talking in this case about uh, nitrogen and phosphorus nutrients. Okay, and you're getting uh, both of them usually, uh, both nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, in in uh, you know in in this uh, but yeah it's so no it's not it's not like you're trading credits for mercury against nitrogen right that's not you know, yeah it's it, it, with a with respect to a particular uh, uh, pollutant because the regulatory limits or the TMDLs are set pollutant by pollutant right so like Ramirez said just said there's a long list of all the pollutants and then a separate number for each one okay yes how often do you <clears throat> Do you have to buy credits, or can you? Is it yearly, or? Um, so yeah, and, and the the thing is that if the farm, well, it depends on what the what what, um, how they're allocated. So you know, for example, if the farmer has put in a permanent BMP, right, that can be then basically a permanent credit for the for the um, sewer treatment plant. They, I mean, they get the benefit of that that credit for a limitless period of time. Um, the agency might say, well, this particular practice is only good for this year. And so you get the, right, and so do you see where, you know, so it's, it's gonna again depend on what reduction practice has, has been adopted and how the regulatory agency would view that as, you know, how long that would last and so on and so forth. So yeah, so it becomes an issue. But you start to see some of the complexity of this, right? Okay, so what does the reading tell us? The reading tells us that one of the problems with this, okay, so this is happening, okay, it's happening, and, um, but one of the problems is that there's not much trading happening between non-point sources and point sources. There's point source to point source trading, there's non-point to non-point uh, trading, but only one example uh, that the author found of non-point to point, okay? And, and uh, so that tells us that it's not really achieving um, all that it was meant to achieve. Another point which is not really addressed very uh, well um, um, is, uh, is what were uh, called hot spots. It's, it's a little unfortunate because uh, it's not really hot. This actually comes from air pollution credits, uh, but uh, concentration by geography and hydrology. So, um, and this is one of the issues over in Floyd's Fork, that um, the, the places where the farmers are reducing the runoff because of their adoption of best management practices is not the same place or same places along the stream as where the sewer treatment plants are putting the nutrients into the stream. Okay? So that might mean that you do not avoid the toxic algae blooms. Right? Okay, right? I mean, so so the toxic algae blooms are um, uh, aren't they upriver up of the of the Big Four Bridge? Isn't that where the the, the, the ones that led to the the, um, the Iron Man swimming being canceled? Right? Isn't that where they are? They're upstream of the Big Four Bridge, I think. Okay. Well, what does that mean? 
it means that if some farmer downstream, Brandenburg or whatever, is reducing their pollutant runoff, not helping any, right? Because everybody see the, the, the issue. I mean, it may help further downstream, but it, it does not uh, really deal with that. And one of the um, concerns with air pollution is almost always your hot spots are low-income neighborhoods of color. Right? They're the places where the old industry is there, the old utilities are there that are not upgrading, that are not improving. And so it's usually out in the rural areas or the suburban areas where you're getting the credits being generated by cleaner air. And then you have the dirtier air in the you know, heavily concentrated urban areas with a lot of industry and old utilities and so forth. Um, so that's another issue um, that is uh, going on. Um, another thing that the author talks about um, is um, something that we've talked about with all of these kinds of voluntary actions is the lack of accountability and measurable progress, okay? It's very easy for all of the participants in this, including the regulatory agencies, to want it to succeed and to want it to have the appearance of success. And so there can be a tendency to just accept the um, claims of reducing runoff without really uh, uh, rigorously measuring, you know, has this farmer really achieved a reduction of 50 or not, right? Um, and there can be a tendency to, to say, well, this 50 is worth that 50, right? And so this gets to the, to the issues that was what uh, Bobby was raising, which is, you know, are you really trading off the same kind of pollutant, not only the same area, but the same effects, the same intensity, the same uh, the impact on the function of the waterway or the watershed, and so forth. And so there can be a general, kind of a looseness about this. We want it to succeed, so hey, let you know nobody rock the boat too much. Let's just accept it uh, as is. And so um, you know, are we actually achieving any measurable progress um, in water quality? Is there any accountability uh, built in? Um, um, <clears throat> so another um, kind of question um, is that presumably one of the reasons to, for doing this is not only is it more voluntary, so you get uh, you know uh, people uh, uh, more likely to accept it than just being told you know you must uh, reduce by X amount under command and control regulation. So so people kind of like it better. Regulated parties like it better. But um, um, and then you know, of course you know they can make money, right? So farmers can make money for example, by uh, uh, adopting some BMPs, and that helps with their bottom line. And so, arguably, it's more economically efficient. But there are some questions about whether that's really true, okay? So, how many of you all have encountered the Coase theorem at all? No, nobody. Oh, God. A couple. <laughs> okay, so, well, you don't count, Pierce, because you, you, you've been through all this... Yeah, and, it, and okay, the Coase theorem does not require uh, crazy mathematical formulas like Pierce posts on uh, Facebook, okay? So that is not what we're talking about. The Coase theorem is um, a, a argument that sort of regardless of what rules you adopt, as long as you have some rules, parties will bargain to the most economically efficient outcome, okay? Parties will bargain to the most economically efficient outcome. So if it's cheaper for farmer A to reduce their um, nutrient runoff than uh, sewer treatment plant B, eventually what will happen is sewer treatment plant B will offer to buy 
the farmer's adoption of BMPs, uh, as, you know, and, and so forth. So that's the theory behind that. But the Coase theorem says absent transaction cost. Okay, absent transaction cost. So part of the whole point of, of what Coase was doing here, the Coase was a this is a famous sort of law and economics uh, article. Okay, um, and so uh, and part of what Coase was doing was saying, hey. When you design systems of rules in law, you need to pay, pay attention to what are called transaction costs. This is the cost of the parties actually getting together and solving the problem, addressing the issue, negotiating, whatever. And so, for example, if your if your bargain solution, if your market solution requires <coughs> a thousand neighborhood residents to come together and bargain with the city and the, the, the water polluter, okay, that's enormous transaction cost, right? To get everybody on board, to get everybody there, to reach some sort of agreement, right? The transaction costs are huge, right, in that scenario, um, and so forth. Um, so one of the challenges with these trading systems is that the, um, the idea of the trade might be economically efficient, but the actual cost of operating these trading systems, of getting them set up, getting the parties together, monitoring, et cetera, is actually pretty substantial. And so, um, you know, question is it more substantial than the regulatory framework and so forth? Uh, well, that's a good question. But again, that's one of the issues here. Um, and then, um, the last is what sort of the point of um, the uh, the article, which is, hey, these uh, trading systems might have the potential to be more flexible, right? More attentive to local conditions, uh, more flexible about. Um, you know, what works, what doesn't work, because we might not know, okay, right? And so part of the problem of doing a purely regulatory approach is what do we know? We know that those pure regulatory approaches are based on certain models, certain assumptions that if you do X, Y will happen, right? And we've talked about that, that the, the, the um, you know, uh, the, 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 the past is not a good prediction of the future. The systems are complex, and we uh, we have lots of uncertainty about what the future is going to be. Lots of surprises, right? We talked about that a number of times, and so we talked about one possible approach is adaptive management to be more flexible and to allow the solutions to change more over time as we learn more, as we sort of see how they're playing out, how they're being implemented, okay? But, and I mentioned this back when we talked about this, but it's a great opportunity to reinforce this. In order for that to happen, you need feedback loops. You need feedback loops. And feedback loops um, involve um, Five things. So monitor, assess, <coughs> learn, revise, act. Okay. So you need to monitor what you're doing and the effects that it's having. Okay. So you have this training system. You need to then have a set of monitoring programs, efforts, actions, etc., where you're looking at, are you actually achieving reductions in nutrients? Where, to what degree, at what times, etc. right? Do you have monitor? Then monitoring is really just about gathering the data. You actually have to look at the data. You have to assess it. What, what do the data tell us? Then you need to learn some lessons from it. Okay, so in, um, in some of these areas, 
of environmental law, there's actually none of this that happens. There's, there is no component of a, of a feedback loop whatsoever. So we do things, we say we're going to be adaptive about it, and then there's no monitoring, no assessment of it. In some of these areas, um, and uh, with water quality, we actually do monitor, okay? But a lot of times, the, the gap is that there's no learning from it. There's no, we, okay, we have a bunch of data. It sits there in some database. Maybe somebody crunches some numbers, but nobody actually says, okay, what lessons are we learning from this, and how can we revise our plans, policies, regulations, actions, etc. right? Okay, it depends on what, what it is you're doing. Um, and then implement the revisions, change, change what we're doing, act uh, in, uh, accordingly. Okay? Um, and so there's a lot of discussion about how to make environmental law more adaptive. And the big gap, the thing over and over again that's the problem is they're almost never adequate feedback loops. And, and that's what's necessary in order to truly have it adaptive. Okay, so what that might mean is that um, some of the aspirations of this pollution credit training program aren't being realized. Having said that, that could be said in different ways of all of the other approaches as well, right? All the, I mean, so I mean, it's not just, you know, being critical of pollution credit trading. All of the approaches that we have have limits, including regulation, including uh, voluntary uh, actions and incentive-based program, including land conservation and management approaches, okay? And so don't get carried away. Uh, the pollution credit trading might not be worse than any of the others, but Nonetheless, um, it was sort of counted as, hey, this is a better way to do it, and some of those, uh, some of those uh, promises haven't yet been revealed, uh, but uh, uh, Professor Scanlon uh, thinks that they could be improved. She thinks that there's uh, opportunity here to uh, do better with this. Okay? Questions? So what do you guys think? You like you, it, like, you think these, uh, by the way, I hear I'm sitting around the attendance watch to be sure it's like it. Uh, but um, you guys think these uh, pollution credit trading systems, good idea, bad idea? Don't know, don't care. But Is there another way you can incentivize using money that's maybe not a, maybe not a, necessarily one of these credits because that I mean it's easier to get people to they, they can understand money a lot right. easier than money. well okay so so um, the the idea here is the the money is coming from other regulated parties so that's what the, that's what a trading system does it creates a market right um, the in contrast the in uh, voluntary and incentive based programs um, all involve money of one sort or another. At the, at, you know, many of them involve paying farmers or paying developers or whatever to adopt best management practices. In some cases, it's not direct payment of funds. In some cases, it's technical assistance. But again, that's being basically funded by the government. Uh, but the question is, how much is the government willing to fund? Is that basically a wealth transfer, right? I mean, so hey, we're going to pay these people to quit polluting the environment. Is that a is that a subsidy? Is it efficient? Does it achieve the effective results? But it's a different way of pay. But I think the big issue is what are the budget capacity limits of the government? And if you could tap into the regulated parties being willing to pay for best management practices through a trading system, that's yeah, that's sort of the theory behind it. That makes sense. Okay, so this is okay. So those of you who are in the environmental field study, this is what 
led to the whole um, watershed, collaborative watershed planning process in Floyd's Fork to totally fall apart. Okay? Those of you who weren't in this class, the basic bottom line, the gist is there were a whole bunch of different stakeholders, um, you know, uh, government entities, uh, private industry, landowners, land developers, public environmental groups, university uh, experts, etc., who are all engaged in an effort to try to come up with a plan to protect, to, 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 to address water quality problems in Floyd's floor, including especially nutrients, especially nutrients, and to try to uh, adopt some conservation measures. Um, one of the proposed solutions that the this multi-stakeholder group was discussing was water quality trading. One of the uh, local environmental based groups, the uh, um, Floyd's Fork Environmental Association, objected to even discussing it. Um, they brought a lawsuit against everybody who was involved saying that this was a that the, the, the group was violating the Open Meetings Act, the state law for open meetings, because they weren't advertising this. Okay, went all the way for, through the, from the trial court all the way to the Kentucky Supreme Court. Every court held that this was not a government action. It was just a group of you know, various stakeholders trying to discuss some ideas. There was no government action. There was no, uh, no uh, the, the basically the open meetings laws were not applicable. But as you can imagine, nobody likes getting sued. And so the whole thing fell apart. Of course, you know, all that cooperation and trust disappeared. And it didn't, you know, I mean, so, so you know, when we talk about collaborative problem solving and those iterations, right? Okay, that's an example of an iteration. Now eventually what happened is um, the, um, the state and uh, the state government and a um, uh, water professor over at UK organized some sort of what was supposedly multi-stakeholder uh, set of um, workshops. But it was, no, it was not really collaborative. What it really was is you came, they presented some ideas, you, you indicated how much you liked them using clickers, and you went home, okay? So that's not, and so they ended up with a report about what people liked and didn't like from the clickers, and nothing more has been done with it, right? So, so that's, a, that's an example of, uh, that's not particularly collaborative, uh, but it was, it's, it was participatory. So it was participatory, but not especially collaborative. Uh, but so in other words, so far, that lawsuit has mostly killed off the cooperation uh, surrounding Floyd's Fork. Mm. And it was all over this pollution credit, credit trading. And the theory about, uh, about the environmentalist is that uh, this was just a smokescreen for paying people to pollute. And therefore, um, and that it was a, you know, you, you weren't going to get any real improvements uh, and you ought to be regulating, you ought to be controlling land development, blah, 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 blah. That was the gist of what their argument. And so uh, they said it was illegitimate to even discuss it. Um, so it's not happening. There's not, there's not pollution cre uh, credit trading happening with Floyd's Fork. But it is happening elsewhere. Um, okay. So I will end with one other. Um, point is that um, all this is, of course, you know, we have different viewpoints, different opinions, and what works, what doesn't, and so forth. Um, I would say that the data seem to show that um, some of these programs here, uh, in particular, more than this one or more than this one, uh, these two are producing significant improvements on along the Green River and the Green River Basin, which as I mentioned before is huge. It's a huge uh, river basin through uh, southern and western Kentucky. The Green River flows through Mammoth Cay. Um, there's also, uh, as I mentioned before, dam removal that's been happening. I think that helps. But there has been really pretty good response of farmers 
um, there. But again, a lot of that is based on that they have been working with local and state officials whom they trust more than the federal officials. I think I mentioned that earlier, uh, but that's just something that's interesting as well. Um, and so maybe, you know, one of the issues in pollution credit trading is what role does trust play um, in um, achieving any of this. All right, so Wednesday, we're going to uh, work our way through problem two. Uh, come prepared to do that. And then next week, we turn to problem number three.